Today on America's Test Kitchen, we're braising everything. Dan makes Julia delicious braised oxtails. Adam reveals his top pick for Dutch ovens. And Becky shows Bridget a foolproof recipe for fava beans with artichokes, asparagus, and peas. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. An oxtail is exactly what it sounds like. It's the tail of an ox, or at least that's what it was traditionally and how they got their name. Today, they can be cut from any of the beef animals, including heifers, cows, and bulls, and Dan's gonna show us how to cook them. So I am very excited to be cooking with these. They make an incredible braise, and that's what we're gonna do. This is a really a world-class one-dish meal that we're gonna do. They're inexpensive, they're super beefy, and if you cook them long enough, they get meltingly tender, mm. so they're awesome. So we're gonna take some inspiration from a, a classic Turkish dish that has beans and tomatoes and some really cool pepper in it. It's got enough flavor to really stand up to the oxtails. All right. So we're gonna start with them, and shopping-wise, there's a little bit to look for with oxtails. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna work with four pounds. You wanna look for the biggest specimens possible. And really that's about getting as much meat as you can. So you can see these guys have lots of nice meat on them compared to that this one. This is the tail end of the tail. The tail end of the tail, exactly. <laughs> Great for making broth, bad for braises. Absolutely, tons of flavor in it, but just not a lot of meat. We're gonna need to roast these, get tons of flavor, and also pull out a lot of that fat so it doesn't end up in our braise. So we're gonna be using a roasting pan. We're gonna pat these dry with paper towels and we're gonna season them up really nicely with kosher salt and pepper. So we've got a lot of meat here, but we also have a lot of fat, and we find that when you have a lot of fat in a recipe, you actually need more salt for it to taste seasoned. We're gonna get them on both sides. We're also gonna roast these, and we're gonna lose a lot of this as we drain the fat. So I'm gonna transfer this now to a 450 degree oven on the lower middle rack. We'll go for about 45 minutes. All right. Mmm. Ooh, that's a bubbling. So they're already starting to look good, but the real key is how much fat we've gotten out of the bottom there. So we're gonna get rid of that. A little bit of fat is obviously really nice, great flavor. Mm -hmm. Too much can ruin a braise. Greasy. Greasy. So we're doing two things here. We're rendering a lot of fat, but we're also developing a ton of fond. I see that. And that means flavor in our braise. Okay, so I'm just gonna pour off this fat in this bowl over here, and then add these right back in. Mmm, smells meaty. Doesn't this smell good? Okay, so we're gonna go back in the oven for just 15 to 20 minutes. We wanna get a little more browning on these and extra fond in the pan. Mm, all right, so look at these beautiful, beautiful oxtails. They're gorgeous. They're nice and brown. They're not tender yet. So we're gonna get them out of the roasting pan here. And you can see we don't have as much fat this time. We got rid of most of that on that first roast. But we do have even better browning and really good fond. Would you mind just covering these with foil for me? Got it. So if you can set those aside. Yep. So we got all this great fond, and the only thing to do now is to scrape it up. So we're gonna have four cups of chicken broth here. Mm. And it makes it easier to clean your pan later, Yeah, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, you can see this broth has turned really nice and brown. All that fond is up. So I'm just gonna get the rest of that four cups mm. in there. Well done. Okay, so we'll leave that aside for just one second, and we're gonna start building our braise in a Dutch oven here. It's gonna be really even heat, and we're gonna use it in the oven, it's perfect. So we're gonna start with two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. So I'm just gonna heat this over medium heat until it starts to shimmer. All right, so it's time for aromatics. We have one onion that is chopped fine, and one carrot. So we're gonna cook this until the veg is softened, about five minutes. All right. All right, well this is, smells good and mm -hmm. it looks good. We've softened up our onion and carrot. So now we're gonna go in with some more aromatics. We've got six cloves of minced garlic, two tablespoons of tomato paste, and two tablespoons of Aleppo pepper. Ooh, Aleppo pepper. Really special pepper. We're using a lot of it because it's not that spicy. It's got really, really nice flavor. And then a teaspoon of minced fresh oregano. So this is really getting that kind of Eastern Mediterranean vibe mm -hmm. to it. Big, big flavors. It's gonna stand up great to the beef. So I'm gonna cook this for about 30 seconds here. You can really smell that Aleppo, right? Yeah. Okay, that looks great. So now I'm going to add our beautiful broth we made over here with all those nice drippings. It's amazing how dark that broth got. I know, When right? you scraped up the brown bits. And to that, I'm also adding a 28 ounce can of whole peeled tomatoes. We're gonna cook this for about three hours in the <laughs> oven, and then we're gonna stir it, and you'll see those tomatoes just melt apart. Really, like really it. nice. So I'm going to bring this up to a simmer, and then it's gonna be time to add our oxtails. Okay. So dried Aleppo is a key flavoring in this dish, 
and it's a key spice used around the Mediterranean and in the Middle East. Now it has a tart bell pepper left in the sun flavor with a subtle but building heat. Now you can find this increasingly in supermarkets, obviously online and in specialty stores, but if you can't find it, simply substitute equal parts paprika, that's for the sun-dried bell pepper flavor, and crushed red pepper flakes, that's for the building heat. Our liquid is at a simmer, so oxtails are going to go in. And that old juice at the end, beautiful. This is coming right back up to a simmer here, and we're going to cover and go into the oven. I dropped that down to 300 degrees, and we're going to go for about three hours to really tenderize these oxtails. Okay. You ready for the big reveal? I am. I can already smell it. Oh, hello. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, that smells so good. So hearty. So this is three hours, and I want to show you how tender these are. I have a fork here, but I could probably use a spoon. Oh, Just look at that. that. That looks delicious. Right? That's beautiful. So what we're going to do is transfer them out of here nice and gently, because they are super tender. OK, great. Would you mind just covering that with foil? And we you can got it. Hold on to that for a minute. Okay, so now I'm going to strain this out so we can get rid of just that little bit of fat that's yeah. still on top there. And you're going to watch these tomatoes just basically fall apart. <laughs> really, really. You know, I was looking at those tomatoes and thinking they're still they're intact. They're still big, right? And I'll just press it through. And this stirring motion right here, these tomatoes just fall apart. They help really thicken the sauce up in a nice way. I'm kind of just scraping the bottom, letting that liquid fall through. Once they break down a little bit, they're going to go right back into the <sighs> pot, just separating them from the liquid. Look at that. Okay, so we're going to go into our fat separator over here. I see. You had to get the vegetables out of the way so you could really defat the liquid. Exactly. This is like pure gold in here. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's been five minutes. We got nice separation between the Ooh, liquid yeah. and the fat there. So we're just going to hit this button here, let the good stuff fall through the bottom. Because you don't want to leave any of that flavorful liquid behind, but you don't want any of the fat. So we're good. I mentioned that beans are in the traditional Turkish version of this dish. So this is a 15 ounce can of navy beans that we drained. We've also got one tablespoon of sherry vinegar, which is also an awesome ingredient. So much flavor. And finally, two teaspoons of fresh oregano. Really pop that fresh flavor at the Yeah. Bowl. So stir this in. Now we're going to add back our beautiful, super tender oxtails. Oh. And that nice liquid. Wasting nothing. Mm -hmm. Oxtails are cooked. We just want to heat those beans through. So we're going to put it over medium heat and cook for about five minutes. Just warm everything through. Then it's time to eat. All right. Now, obviously, you could make this ahead to this point if you were serving it for company. Absolutely. Yeah. And it would even get better over a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Then you could just put it back on the heat when the guests arrive. All right. It's time to serve this up. Everything is heated through. It is looking gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I'm going to platter this up here. What I love about this dish is it's a braise, which aren't always the most beautiful thing, but this is absolutely gorgeous, and it's going to look beautiful on a nice platter. I'm going to spoon one nice cup of our braising mm. liquid and vegetables over the top here, and then we'll serve the rest on the plate. Oh, that smells good. The Aleppo pepper, it's just, it's been mellowed, but it still smell it. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm choosing the perfect piece for you here. Oh, I appreciate it. This is pure comfort food. Oh, right? yeah. Now, you used your knife there, but I don't, I did. I don't think that was necessary. It was really just to prevent the whole thing from pulling off the bone at once, just because this is really tender. Mmm. That is so good. That mm. meat is so rich and so deep in flavor. Mm. And it really just peels right off the bone there. Oh, it there. just falls away. And with the brightness of the sherry vinegar and the heat of the Aleppo pepper, mm. this is a terrific cold weather dish. It's good, right? This is delicious. Thank you. Thank you. So if you want to make a world-class oxtail dish, start by roasting the oxtails in a 450-degree oven. Use the drippings left in the pan to build a flavorful braising liquid along with onion, garlic, and dried Aleppo pepper. Then braise the oxtails in the oven until tender. Before serving, defat the braising liquid and stir in some navy beans and cherry vinegar. So there you have it, from America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, a great new recipe for braised oxtails with white beans, tomatoes, and Aleppo pepper. I'm definitely making this one. Oh, yeah. This is a new one to the winter roster. In France, they call it une coco, and in South Africa, it's known as a pocha. But here in the U.S., we call it a Dutch oven, and I wouldn't want to cook in a kitchen without one.
So luckily I've got Adam here. He's gonna show us which one won our testing. These are true kitchen workhorses, Bridget. They are. All right, we have 11 Dutch ovens here that were all about six to eight quarts and the price range was a low of $54.31 to a high of $367.99. That's quite a spread. Yes. Most of these pots were enameled cast iron. We love the heat retention qualities of cast iron for a Dutch oven. Two of them were outliers. That one down at the very end is just plain cast iron, no enamel coating. And this one right here is ceramic. The ceramic one is significantly lighter. And you know, if that was a viable alternative, we were definitely interested in that. Sure, sure. So let me tell you about the tests. Okay. The cooking tests included searing meatballs and then simmering them in tomato sauce, braising beef burgundy, frying french fries, and baking almost no need bread. And the pots were evaluated on the quality of the food and how easy these pots were to use and to clean. So let's talk about some design factors that affected ease of use. Okay. The first one is the cooking surface, and that relates to the shape of the pot, and that relates to the sides of the pot. Ah, okay. You want the largest cooking surface that you can get because that means fewer batches when you're, say, browning meatballs or meat for sure. stew, something like that. This one has sides that kind of curve in yeah. towards the bottom. Sure that takes away some of your cooking surface. So this one had a fairly small cooking surface at eight inches, whereas the sides sides of this one don't curve in. They're pretty straight. Mm -hmm. That left more cooking surface nine and three quarter inches. Okay. We also paid attention to the interior finish. This one is dark and that actually made it a little harder for testers to judge what's going on with the fond when they were searing meat or meatballs. Sure. It also made it hard to see the tip of a remote thermometer when they had it in there when they were frying french fries. Much easier to work with a lighter colored interior. Weight was another important factor. Like I mentioned, cast iron Dutch ovens are almost always heavy. Sure. And the range in this lineup was just over 18 pounds. That's this guy to nine and three quarter pounds. And why don't you do a little weightlifting for me, Bridget? All right. Try that one. So this is empty and this is really heavy. I mean, imagine this full of hot fat or a big cassoulet, something like exactly. that. Exactly. And how much does this weigh again? Nine and three quarter pounds. All right. Oh yeah, no, totally. I could Featherly. carry my kids around in that. Yeah, so it's a point in favor of the ceramic sure. one. Another important design feature was the handles. Because, you know, if you're lifting a stew or your cassoulet mm -hmm. out of the oven, it's hot, it's heavy, you want something to grip onto. And testers really preferred big, open-looped, beefy handles like this one. Give nice those a try. Nice and secure. Yep. Yeah. And compared to little tiny tab handles like that one, lift that one up. Yeah, I mean, you have to use your fingertips. Oh, that's heavy too. You have to use your fingertips. <coughs> And I can't even imagine if it was hot and it had big pot holders or exactly. towels. Exactly. Right? Oven mitts or right? pot holders do not make that any easier. These should be pots for the long haul. I actually have friends who are using their grandmother's hand-me-down Dutch ovens. Exactly. And so we wanted to get a sense of their durability and that meant abuse testing. The testers performed three abuse tests, scrubbing the pots clean 10 times with an abrasive sponge, whacking the rim 50 times with a metal spoon, and slamming the lid onto the base 25 times. Wow. Now, all but two of these survived unscathed. Mm -hmm. They're pretty strong. This was, unfortunately, the downfall of our lightweight <laughs> ceramic. Here it is. <gasps> Check it out. Yeah, fissure there. It's only going to get bigger with more use. And that was just putting it down from a two-inch height. Wow. So that pretty much kills it. It's too fragile to be sure. a serious workhorse kitchen right. pot. One of the other pots got a little chip in the enamel, but it really didn't affect its functionality okay. at all. So in the end, we had our winner, which was no surprise. This is the Le Creuset yep. seven and a quarter quart round Dutch oven. We've loved it in the past. We still love it. It's $367.99. The price will make you gasp, but it's 13.7 pounds, so it's a nice manageable weight. It's got a light interior. It's really durable. It's just, it's a great pot. If you don't want to spend that much money, and a lot of people don't, there is a Best Buy. All right. This is the Cuisinart Chef's Classic Enameled Cast Iron Covered Casserole. This is the one that got a little tiny chip in it from the abuse testing, but again, it didn't affect the functionality. It's a little bit heavier than our winner, but it's got the big, wide cooking surface. It's got the easy to see light interior, and this one was only $83.70. That's a big difference. Yeah. Well, there you go. If you want a Dutch oven for the long run, look no further than the Le Creuset Round Dutch Oven. It's $3.67.99. There you go.
For a few weeks in spring, Romans celebrate the incoming fresh vegetables by making a dish called vignarola. Now, it's a brothy concoction of fava beans, spring peas, and, of course, artichokes. It can be thick, like a stew, or brothy and served over pasta, but Becky has a fresh and very quick version that's really going to highlight the freshness of this dish. That's right. We're going to do a really nice springtime braise, and we're going to cook all the vegetables perfectly. Lovely. So let's start with some vegetable prep. We have four three-ounce little baby artichokes. Aren't these adorable? They're adorable. So we're going to take off just the end here. We want to leave about a three-quarter inch stem okay. on the end. I'm going to lop off the top quarter here. And you just want to peel off these dark outer leaves mm -hmm. starting at the bottom because these are tough. They are tough. I mean, it's a thistle. Yeah, I don't know how people ever discovered that these were edible. <laughs> Who was the first person? <laughs> you just work slowly. We're going to take off three or four layers here. Okay. Anything that's dark green has to go. Okay, so now you can see we're getting to the nice tender part. You can mm -hmm. tell. See how it turns a little bit yellow there? Sure does. We'll get rid of that one that has a little bit of darkness on it. And I'm just going to use my paring knife. I want to pare away this dark, tough area okay. on the stem. Using a paring knife as a paring That's knife. That's right. Not as a peeler. You could use a peeler yep. if you found it a little tricky to use a paring knife. So that's nice and clean. We've taken off all the tough outer layer. Great. And we're going to cut this in quarters. And that's ready to go. So I have two quarts of water over here. And you'll see that there's a lemon in there. And I squeezed that lemon in earlier to make okay. the water acidulated. Mm -hmm. That's because the artichokes will oxidize almost instantly. They do. The lemon juice will prevent them from turning brown and Great. keep them nice and pretty. And add a little bit of lemon flavor. Yeah, exactly. So there's a total of four baby artichokes in there. They're about three ounces each. OK. So let's move on to our next veggie, fava beans. You don't see them very much. No, you don't. Yep. They're, they're a little bit hard to find. Yep. This, this is what they look like fresh in a pod here. Beautiful. And we're just going to strip them out of the pod. You just dig right in there, and they pop right out. And kind of slide your hand down the seam there. So we want a pound of these. These are going to give some heft to our dish. The fava beans have protein in them, and they're a little bit meaty in texture, a little bit dense. Now, if you can't find fresh fava beans, it's fine to use frozen. OK. And so one pound of favas in the shell is going to equal about one cup shelled. OK. So speaking of shells, I just went through all that work, and these actually have one more little outer skin here. They now, do. a lot of times you'll see recipes where you have to slip off this outer skin. It's like a membrane on the outside. Yeah, it's not easy to do. I don't want to have to do that entire bowl. You do not. So we were happy to find that just by blanching the favas in a baking soda solution, just for a minute or two, softens those, that outer skin enough mm. so it's totally tender. That's great. So I have two cups of water boiling here. And I'll add in a teaspoon of baking soda. OK. And that's enough to tenderize the skins without giving the beans a soapy taste. OK. We'll put these in here for one or two minutes. And we're going to see the edges of the beans start to darken. They might turn a little bit purple. That's because we raised the pH of the water. I see. That's totally normal. OK. OK, so it's been about two minutes. You can see some of them, like this little guy here, starting to turn a little bit dark in color. A little bit purple, yeah. Yep. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to drain these and give them a really good rinse. That's going to stop the cooking okay. and wash off all that baking soda. All right. Rinse under cold. All right. So let's continue on getting our braise going here. All right. I have a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil heating up over medium heat. And here is one leek, just the white and the light green part. I got rid of the dark green. We sliced these thin and washed them really, really well because, as you know, leeks can be super, super dirty. Sure can. So you can see our oil is starting to shimmer nicely there. Seeing a little bit of shimmer. So let's put the leeks in. That's a good sound. Always a nice sound. Teaspoon of salt. And I'm also adding a tablespoon of water. We don't want these to brown. We're going to let these cook until they soften. That's going to take about three minutes. All right. Now, often when we cook onions, or in this case, leeks, we'll add some salt right at that time when we add them to the skillet. And it's because the salt helps to break down the cell walls of the onions or leeks, and it softens them even faster. Those are nice and soft. They look great. Beautiful. Smell great. Now I'm going to add three cloves of minced garlic. OK. And we'll just cook this for about 30 seconds, start to smell it almost right away. Right away. Now we're cooking. So now let's add our artichokes. They take the longest to cook, so we're going to get these in the pot first. Just want to drain off that water. Mm. And now I have a cup of chicken broth. You could also use vegetable broth. Either one's totally fine. The aromas that just erupted Ooh, in the I test know. kitchen. Just crazy. So nice. I just turned down the heat to medium-low. We're going to let this cook for six to eight minutes until the artichokes are just about tender. Okay. 
So we'll put the lid on. Let's move on to the asparagus. Okay. We have a pound of asparagus. A lot of people take the asparagus and they snap off the end, right? Did it for years. Recently we found that all you really need to cut off is that bottom inch. And you can see that it starts to get nice and tender right there. Exactly. Beautiful. So we can line this up and use it as a guide. These all came from the same bunch, so we can assume that's good for all of them. Now we're going to cut these in two inch lengths, just a little bit on the bias. In the spring, when you get your hands on the vegetables and they're at their best, it's a game changer. Oh, it is. Such a delight. It is a delight. <laughs> Speaking of delights, I have a pound of fresh peas. You can use frozen, but if you find the fresh ones, there's nothing like them. These are kind of like the favas. You just have to get in there, split open that pod. So again, a pound in their shells is going to yield about a cup. So our peas are all set. Let's take a look at our artichokes. They've been going for about six minutes. They're not fully tender, but they're getting there. Okay. They're close. So let's put in our peas. Again, that was a pound of peas and our asparagus. Now these don't take that long to cook. That's why we're adding them in stages here. Okay. These are going in at the end. Give that a little stir. This is beautiful. All right, so we'll put the lid back on. We'll let this go for about five minutes longer till everything's nice and tender. Okay. All right, let's take a look here. It's been about five minutes. It gets better and better every time you open up the skillet. The last thing to add is our fava beans. Okay. These are the ones that we blanched for a couple minutes. And these just need to kind of warm through. They take about two minutes to get tender. Okay. So we'll stir those in and we'll put the lid back on just until the favas and the artichokes are fully tender. Okay. All right, so it's been two minutes. Ooh, beautiful. Everything's nice and tender, so I'm gonna kill the heat and I'm gonna just take this off the heat. I don't want it to cook anymore. I don't want anything to get overdone. It'll turn gray. Okay. Let's liven it up with some fresh herbs. All right. I have two tablespoons of basil that's mm. nice and thinly sliced. Tablespoon of fresh mint that's minced up. Two teaspoons of lemon zest, and that'll really add some nice brightness. It's an orchestra of spring and summer even oh. aromas in here. Literally licking my chops mm. right now. Okay, let's get this on a platter. That is insanely beautiful. How is that for a nice springtime lunch or light dinner? That is gorgeous. That's all you need, right? Ugh. All right, let me give you a nice serving here. Ugh. Got the artichokes, the favas. Everything I want in a bowl. More extra virgin olive oil. That's just gonna add a little bit of richness. If this tastes as good as it smells and it looks, we're gonna be in business here. Even <laughs> halfway as good as it looks oh, and I smells. Know. Everything is perfectly cooked. So tender, right? I'm saying nothing. <laughs> Everything is beautiful. You're speechless. I am. The artichokes are still really, really creamy and tender. Mm. And the fresh basil and mint really livens it up. This really is a celebration of spring vegetables. Thank you, Becky. You're very welcome. Well, this beautiful spring vegetable braise starts with a little prep. Trim, quarter, then submerge baby artichokes in lemon water. Shell and simmer fresh fava beans with baking soda and then rinse. Saute leeks and garlic, add the artichokes and broth and simmer. Cut asparagus and add to the broth along with fresh shelled peas. Stir in fava beans, then finish with basil, mint, and lemon. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, a beautiful spring vignarola, or fava beans with artichokes, asparagus, and peas. Beautiful. Mm. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.